day, chaps and chapettes. I've got with me today Dr. Rolf Sattler. Dr. Rolf is interested in Alfred Korzybski. Uh, amongst other things, his profession was that of a plant morphologist and lecturer at McGill University for over 30 years. And he recently put out a book which you should absolutely purchase. I repeat, absolutely purchase. It's a wonderful book. It's not long. It's not filled with academies or other opaque uh, nonsense. It's highly accessible. For those, this book is called Science and Beyond Towards Greater Sanity Through Science, Philosophy, Art, and Spirituality. And now, uh, of all the times where we need to reintroduce a little bit of sanity into the way we think about science and all different kinds of other issues, I think Rolf's book couldn't have come at a better time. Just for context, Korzybski was a philosopher, I suppose, of science uh, earlier last century, and he developed a system that essentially was non-Aristotelian in the sense that it sought to question the underpinnings, the logical underpinnings of the, the way we abstract and argue and speak. And I myself found it to be so elegant, and the prescription is so elegant, and it is so powerful when you implement it. I can definitely speak to that. So anyway, I hope you get something out of this chat. I know I certainly did. Rolf has a wealth of experience and knowledge, and I'm sure after listening to this, your interest would have increased in understanding the logical underpinnings of how you perceive the world around you. Of course, links to all books mentioned in the description. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. I'm here with Rolf Sattler. Welcome, Rolf. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm Pleasure. happy to talk about, about Kosivsky. <laughs> yeah, Very likewise. Happy. It's one of my favorite subjects as well. You've... Uh, written a book, Science and Beyond, Towards a Greater Sanity Through Science, Philosophy, Art, and Spirituality. Um, I am one of the many people that have happily gotten my hands on that one, and I've got to say it was an excellent read. It was entertaining and enlightening. Uh, there was no difficult academies, which I appreciate. Uh, so congratulations on that. It's, it's an excellent book. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> now, I think um, a good place to start. Your work is obviously based on many of the principles of general semantics, uh, which I will add has, in your book in particular, you have a lot more integrated into that. So it's not just general semantics, as far as I could tell, but you've taken general semantics and you've really run with it and you've taken it in interesting directions that um, I found extremely fascinating. Uh, but we won't go into that just yet. Uh, I think a good place to start would be to just get into your intellectual background and then we can perhaps go into how this led to you finding general semantics and the work of Korzybski. Well, I, I was professor at McGill University for 33 years carried out research in plant morphology on the development and evolution of plant form. And um, as a result of these studies, I learned a lot. At that time, I, I did not know yet uh, about uh, Kosipsky. In fact, I discovered him rather late in my life. But independently, I came to very similar conclusions. And so when I, when I finally read his magnum opus, uh, it, was, it was just, a, in a way, a confirmation of what I had, had learned through my research and, um, and, and uh, from, from colleagues, teachers, and so on. So, uh, so that, that was a tremendous discovery. Really, I, I I consider his book one of the most uh, science and sanity, one of the most important books of, of the twentieth century, because I think it it could, if if it would be if general semantics would be taught in kindergarten, elementary school, high school, university, 
I think we would live in a in a different world, in a better world, in a in a world with gr greater sanity, less conflict, <laughs> probably less war. Uh, mm. It's of tremendous significance, but unfortunately, there are not too many people who know about Kosipsky. There are people who have come to somewhat similar insights, but I, I find that uh, I don't I don't <laughs> meet many people who know about Kosipsky. I agree. He, um, in a way, science and sanity is is an extremely difficult work. I would say for the average person, it's not entirely accessible and i think that that's what your book does so well is it brings those concepts down to earth so people can understand maybe what he was getting at more easily yes i think kosipsky had really great ideas but he was not the best writer and his book uh, 800 pages is not very well organized therefore as you know the uh, the Society for General Semantics um, issued what they call selections from uh, science and sanity. This is a, a booklet, maybe of a hundred pages or so, and this this is much more accessible. And what's even better, I find, is a book by Kotisch and Gotisch uh, called um, Drive Yourself Sane. <laughs> this is just about the best uh, introduction to uh, Korsipsky and general semantics I've come across. And it's easy to read, easy to understand. So uh, there are some other books too. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, reading uh, Science and Sanity, 800 pages, is not the best way to to learn about uh, Kosipsky, I think. That's for sure. I think it took me about 10 years to to fully go through the entire work. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll have to look those other ones up. I've not read them. Um, so I think that's a good segue. I, I want to start in maybe a slightly different way because I guess, unfortunately, uh, we're getting a very, very strong dose of the prevalent ways of logic and reasoning that that the West engages in, in contemporary culture at the moment. Um, and what's special about this current time period, I think that much of the conflict that's going on with, uh, we have this virus and various reactions to it, that this conflict is very much science-based. It's not a war. It's not uh, a mammalian uh, <laughs> Uh, war of aggression and testosterone necessarily. It's it's about science and interpretations of science. One of the things that I've noticed is whatever side people are on, they are very, very certain of themselves and what they think, and they're absolutely certain about what should be done. I think one of the most most important takeaways from general semantics for me, and it's something you talk about in your book, is the idea of uncertainty as very much a virtue. Um, why do you think people now appear to be so uh, damn certain of themselves? <laughs> I think... Uh I think because they still take Aristotelian logic for granted. Uh, and uh, many think that this is the only logic we have. And as you know, Aristotelian logic is based on the three so-called laws of thought. The first one, uh, law of identity, A is A. The second one, law of non-contradiction, something cannot be both A and non-A, and the third one, the law of the excluded middle. So there's no, no nothing in the middle. It must be only either or. And I think this is really at the base of much of the conflict that we experience now, especially through the pandemic, but also long before, that, that people are just so entrenched in either or. So... Either you are right or you are wrong. And, uh, and that creates so much conflict and in, in, it inhibits uh, dialogue. And uh, so I think it's, it's, this is really, really very much at the base. And uh, as you know, uh, Kosipsky called his general semantics non-Aristotelian uh, 
kinds of thinking, or I don't recall the exact, but non-Aristotelian. And by non-Aristotelian, he didn't want to exclude uh, Aristotelian logic. He just wanted to show that it's very limited. In extreme cases, one can have an either or, maybe something even coming close to identity. But um, in, in general, it's it's so limited and it it leads to insanity as a, a yeah. form of insanity as Kosipsky has has pointed out. I find it striking, you know, that um, identity plays such an important role in our society in our lives, and you hear more and more these days. Oh my identity, your identity. Well, then we have two different identities and immediately they are in conflict. Mm. But in, in, in the real world, there is no identity. No object is exactly identical with any other object. And I today, I'm not even identical with what I was yesterday or a month or a year ago. So mm. uh, as you know, and uh, Her Heraclitus knew that long ago when he said nobody can step twice in the same river because yeah. the second time the river has changed and and the person has changed and so there's no identity. But I find, I find in our society, I see a real cult of identity because so much reference to it and this creates division and conflict and maybe even more. And um, then the second law, well, um, that something cannot be uh, both A and not A. Well, I think uh, in quantum physics, eventually they learned that uh, that light, uh, you know, in the 19th century, the debate was whether light is essentially a particle or a wave phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Again, either or. But then Niels Bohr came along and said it can manifest as both a particle and wave. So he introduced a both end logic, which is very important for Korsipsky. And that leads to complementarity that what has been uh, considered mutually exclusive before now becomes complementary. So one view is not antagonistic to the other, but it complements the other. And um, yes, and uh, also the excluded middle. So this is this is really, I think, I, as I see it, at the base of a lot of our misery in our personal lives, also in relationships, in our culture, and uh, on an international level too. I, I always found it somewhat ironic that, <clears throat> pardon me, that the people with all these identities now were constructing those identities to try and break down the, you know, uh, the, the so-called oppression caused by the old identities. So really all that's ended up happening is you've just stacked on more identities. <laughs> and uh, I guess that talks to the fact that there, there must be, as you're, you're going through now, a epistemological starting point with these laws of thought that nobody in the world seems to be aware of. And it just leads to all these absurd and ridiculous outcomes Yes, yes. And yeah. I think, therefore, we have to create awareness of how limited these laws of thought are. Mm. But uh, this awareness is, is lacking to a great extent, even among scientists. Uh, I found among my colleagues, they also very often had the attitude, either I'm right or, or, or <laughs> either I am right or you are right, either mm. or, you know, they couldn't see that uh, both could have a, maybe a different perspective on reality. That's one thing I, in my lab, I explored with a colleague from Switzerland, Royal Frutishauser. Uh, there are different uh, contradictory and antagonistic uh, ways of looking at plants. And uh, what we pointed out is that although they, they appear antagonistic and contradictory, they illuminate different aspects of plant construction. And so having both is enriching. And uh, the same, of course, in quantum physics, it was also in enriching to recognize the complementarity. And I think we need more of that. We, we need to see that when we are different, 
it may be just due to different perspectives. And if we can see both perspectives, then uh, we have a, a wider, a more inclusive view and we come closer to sanity. Hmm. There, there seems to be uh, no recognition that we are, we are limited creatures. We are limited in our ability perhaps to grasp uh, the object and that the subject is intimately involved with abstracting from the object. Um, often, many scientists have, have missed this. And, and I think, as you say, uh, in the hard sciences, this seems to be less of a problem because knowledge is defined by the operations conducted. So it, it doesn't come into the spotlight as much. But I think in the social sciences, it's it's a real problem because without understanding these underpinnings of logic, we get into all sorts of crazy arguments about things that, um, as you say, there's no need for it. And what's interesting, I've, I've been seeing a lot on social media recently because things are very much heating up lately, that when people engage in an argument, as you say, you have these laws and it comes from the perspective of either or. So this argument or debate is happening and the people who go into it, from the outset, there must be a, a winner and a loser. There cannot be a mutual acknowledgement of, of anything. And this is related to Aristotle's laws, is, is it's an either or, or an or. Um, uh, how do you get this message across to people? Have you tried in your academic life to, to convey this to your colleagues and, and, uh, and, and to show them the way, <laughs> uh, better ways of, of communicating? Uh, with my colleagues, with most of them, uh, uh, I haven't been very successful, but a lot more with students because I find students, even if they come um, with a sort of um, preconceived uh, with preconceived ideas, they they still have a certain openness. And I've taught for a long time a course uh, on philosophy of biology, and uh, I was amazed uh, how they could open up uh, during one semester, during three months. So. Um, that's that's why I think if if this would be taught uh, at universities and uh, also in schools, uh, even kinder kindergarten, and if parents would be aware of that, that would be also very important. Like for example, you know, at a certain age, uh, people uh, look at a flower and they ask uh, uh, children. I mean, they ask, "What is this?" And then and then the parent says, "This is a flower." But that's where the problem starts, right? Because this, we should say, we call this a flower. What it is, according to Korsipsky, is it's the unspeakable. And so if we would say, we call it a flower, what it is, we don't know. It's mysterious. So this would open uh, an appreciation for the mysterious. And through the mysterious, I think people can become connected uh, uh, and uh, therefore, it, it could start, this education, um, this could start very, very early on. But mm. um, I think education goes just in the opposite direction. Uh, we give these names and then we think this is this and we know all this and so on. And it continues like that. And uh, and uh, that that is very unfortunate, I think. Yeah. As they, as as he said, the map is not the territory, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a, a lesson we could all do well to learn. Um, what what led me personally, uh, in regards to what you're just saying, um, to really no longer see general semantics as just a theory, but more so a practical tool for living, was uh, my practices in zazen and and Buddhism. Uh, and, and what I came to understand is that there is a uh, an enormous uh, oceanic segment uh, of the totality of non-verbal and non-abstract experience that there is an ocean of uh un the, the unknowable i guess is is the way to put it um and this is something that i think the east is in many ways more well versed in than we are uh, in the West here, philosophically. Um, 
you go into some of the Eastern views of logic uh, and thought in your book. Um, how do these outlooks differ from the ancient Greek outlooks? Uh, and I think in particular, you got into Buddhism and Jainism and, and their forms of logic in particular. What, what are the differences between these worldviews? Well, they differ fundamentally because uh, Aristotelian log logic is binary, yes or no, right or wrong, true or false, and so on. And so it has uh, two values, uh, just either or, whereas Buddhist logic has four values. Uh, it has also either or, but then in addition, both and, and neither nor. And both end, of course, is very important because it allows us to embrace different perspectives, as for Kamel in quantum physics. Uh, and the neither nor, that leads, I think, even beyond uh, beyond logic. It, it leads into the mystery because mm. it, it indicates we cannot say it is neither this nor that. So what it, what is it? It's, it's the unspeakable. Mm. So I think this is a very comprehensive logic. And uh, Jain logic is even more comprehensive because mm. according to Jain logic, every statement should be preceded by uh, by uh, uh, saying um, uh, saying from this perspective or um, arguably or uh, in a way. So if we if we say, for example, um, he he is bad. Uh, that's one statement in uh, according to Aristotelian logic. Uh, that means he is not good. According to Jain uh, logic, we would say, in a way, he is bad, but in a way, he is also not bad, <laughs> because I think you can easily in every person who is bad, you can discover something good too, and uh, in a way. He is indescribable. That points again. Alone. And then there are combinations of these. Uh, in a way, he is good and not good and indescribable and so on. So you end up with seven different perspectives for each statement. I find this mind boggling. Mm. And I, wish, <laughs> I, I wish I could be always aware of that when I say yeah. something in daily life because Although I, st I understand this logic, I think habits are very strong. And I find myself also getting trapped in either or where it's not appropriate. And in my book, I have been trying very hard to avoid uh, the ease of identity and the mm. ease of predication. But uh, I doubt that I have always succeeded because it's very hard. It's so easy to say he is this or this is this and so on uh, it just comes so naturally so one has to make a real effort and therefore um, disciples of um, Korsipsky have stressed we actually need training in general semantics it's not enough to just uh, understand it uh, uh, we 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 have to retrain ourselves and i i am very much aware of this and I am still, uh, yeah. I still need training. I mean, I, I because I catch myself too often that I yeah. I say something which is not not <laughs> quite a nor non Aristotelian. Mm. It is. It's so difficult because it seems to be tied up with our emotions almost. The way that we speak seems to like wh when you use the verb to be and you make an absolute statement about somebody and. Uh, for example, I saw someone the other day on Twitter say, this person is a fraud. And as far as I could tell, the person they were accusing of being a fraud was entirely reasonable. Um, but that must have felt good to say, this person is a fraud. It it's kind of seems to be intimately tied up with our circuitry as mammals. Do, do you think that that kind of thing is natural to human beings and, and general semantics is seeking to overcome something that that we are or is it um just the way we're acculturated when we're young i i often wonder yeah i i don't i, I think it's mainly cultural influence because uh, mm. 
uh, in in Taoism, uh, we have yin yang, and uh, as you know, yin comprises also the yang and vice versa. And then Buddhist and Jain logic also very ancient. So, uh, but in the West, I mean, Aristotle has had such an enormous influence. Um, as you may know, I mean, Thomas Aquinas uh, considered him the philosopher. So he also introduced this logic into religion. And of course, we find it very often in religion is intolerance that also people think my religion is right, yours is wrong. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's, uh, it's a strong, strong cultural uh, influence in our, in our Western culture. Mm -hmm. And also the early, uh, early universities, I think, were very much dominated by Aristotelian thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, Plato also has had an enormous influence uh, um, through his um, idea of forms, uh, the eternal forms, which are essences. And one essence, of course, is another, uh, excludes another one. And so this also divides. Uh, and uh, I think um, Plato, of course, was a, a great philosopher and he mm. was, he could be also critical of um, of his essentialism, and I, I read somewhere that he, at the end of his life he even lost interest in it. But commonly, Plato is is known as an essentialism, as someone who knows the truth of the his essences. And um, and Aristotle also a great philosopher who who could be skeptical about the the laws of thought, and the, he recognized, for example, also the more or less. Uh, so uh, that means um, that the law of the excluded middle is limited. So yeah, they were great philosophers, but how they were then um, seen and interpreted later on was very one-sided. And that one-sided interpretation, I think, has had an enormous and, in my opinion, catastrophical influence on our Western culture. And, mm -hmm. and Western culture, of course, has in, infected practically all cultures around the world. So, so, <laughs> so therefore, this, this, this influence has, has become worldwide. That's that's interesting. I, I was wondering if you thought that uh, Aristotle and Plato meant to uh, meant for things to turn out this way, or if people just misinterpreted what they were putting putting forward. I'm I'm unclear because, uh, like you, I think Plato. I, I read things in there that uh, would indicate that this either or logic was not necessarily the point of what he was getting at. But it seems like people have taken it afterwards and run with it and use it in ways that perhaps it wasn't intended philosophically. Is that is that your view, or do you think that they just made a mistake, so to speak? Uh, I, I think so. I mean, there are yeah. definitely uh, many passages where where Plato supported um, essentialism, mm. and uh, but. Um, but he wrote his uh, his his works are written as dialogues, and mm. so so there is a to and fro, and uh, and so it's not so categorical. I think he was really much more flexible in his thinking than is generally acknowledged. Um, sure. And the same is true for Aristotle. The same is true for I would think for most great philosophers. Uh, and um, unfortunately, often one aspect is, is 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 taken out and considered characteristic, and others are o omitted, and um, and that's uh, that's unfortunate. Um, yeah. I, um, as a plant morphologist, I, I I have been very interested in the German poet and scientist Goethe. I'm sure. Uh, yeah. And uh, who is considered one of the founders or co-founders of uh, of plant morphology, and um, I gave a, was invited to give a talk uh, not too long ago, a few a couple of years ago, about Goethe's morphology, and I found out that he embraced uh, nine different worldviews. <laughs> So, so yeah. I mean, uh, so someone referred to him as the all-embracing uh, Goethe, and uh, that is also very often uh, missed. Uh, so, um, 
Yes, uh, he, he, we often we often interpret uh, philosophers and um, writers in a very narrow way and uh, mm. don't give credit to all the different angles and perspectives. What what were those nine philosophies that he embraced out of interest? I've uh, never heard that. <laughs> well, the first one, essentialism, uh, because uh, in his uh, famous booklet, uh, the the metamorphosis of plants. Uh, he uh, he said that uh, essentially uh, all the lateral appendages of a of a of a plant along the stem all are essentially the same. That means a, a foliage leaf uh, and uh, a sepal and a petal and the stamen and uh, and the carpel. Although they look very different. They are essentially the same, <laughs> and uh, and that disregards, of course, uh, the the differences. So, um, but I found that he was also very critical uh, about essentialism, and he actually dis deconstructed, in a way, his um, his his uh, the main tenet of his uh, famous uh, booklet. <laughs> and then Goethe was a very uh, organic thinker and so he didn't like mechanistic mechanism me mechanicism and mechanistic thinking but mm. he admitted that there's also a role for mechanistic thinking and that discoveries have been made and can be made through mechanistic thinking so he also embraced maybe less but he also embraced uh, uh, mechanism and then he was very very holistic uh, so uh, if you consider holism as a as a worldview, then he embraced that because he emphasized always the whole and the importance of the whole. And then uh, he, I, I, I distinguish also a fuzzy worldview that recognizes the fuzzy fuzziness of everything and fuzzy logic, and and he he recognized that too. And. Um, well, then he was a very dynamic thinker. So uh, dynamic worldview, he he embraced that because he, he recognized very much that everything changes. He, he also embraced animism. Uh, he referred to a world soul, and um, he um, he embraced uh, mysticism. So uh, because he he referred uh, often to the unspeakable to the indescribable. So I found it interesting, you know, mm. that he he embraced all these worldviews because uh, among my colleagues, I could not find that too often. <laughs> there are many who mainly were mechanists and uh, materialists and everything else uh, was considered the illusion. Um, and uh, sometimes among uh, holistically oriented people, there's a tendency also to emphasize so much holism and, and, and give no credit at all to mechanism. And I mean, in our culture, we have learned so much through mechanistic science, uh, mm. which I find very limited. But nonetheless, I mean, we have discovered a lot this way. So yes, uh, uh, I think um, Goethe is a, a wonderful example for uh, someone who could really embrace many different worldviews and many different perspectives. Yeah, perspectivism is also a worldview among these nine, and um, and I th he could see different perspectives. Even in his booklet, The Metamorphosis of Plants, he introduced two perspectives, two different views of the leaf, um, definition of the leaf, that he considered complementary. So, yes, uh, I mean, he was a perspectivist. Uh, the, 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 the word perspectivism, the term was coined by, as far as I know, by Friedrich Nietzsche. Mm. And uh, he uh, was a forerunner of uh, postmodernism. And I, I consider Nietzsche very important. And this whole idea of perspectivism, I find very important because I think it could uh, lead to a greater understanding and uh, could bring divergent views together instead of uh, separating them and then creating an antagonism and war. Hmm. Well, it sounds like Goethe was having a, a good time by the sounds of things. That's uh, it's quite something to embrace all that. Uh, on, on, on Nietzsche for a second, um, 
something I've been trying to explain to people is this idea that facts are imbued with values to a large degree, uh, which is no one recognizes that uh, these days. It seems to be the case that here are objective facts. The science proves it. Uh, you know, there, the, I am not involved in this uh, fact here. Uh, how is Nietzsche important in ascribing values to to facts? I think he famously uh, investigated that, didn't he? Yeah, well, it's it's often assumed that science is uh, is value neutral and uh, values belong to morals and ethics and uh, science investigates what is whereas morals and ethics uh, investigates what what we should do what ought to be and uh, this distinction is very often made but i think uh, it it is it doesn't hold very well we are often not aware of the of the values that um, influence our description of the world i think one value that is often hidden in descriptions uh, for example um, animal behavior or biology and so on is the value of competition that plays an important role in in capitalism and um, if you look at um, at a biology textbook you find uh, in the index you find a lot of entries um, uh, on competition in in some of them you may not find cooperation at all or very little about cooperation. So that shows, I think, very clearly how a, a, a predominant value in our culture influences a description of what we consider facts. Mm. It's an interesting one. I've, I've often spoken about that. Uh, we, we live in a kind of, I think it was Thomas Hobbes who, who had the, the notion of a war of all against all. Whereas... Uh, uh, I've been to the Amazon, I've been to various other places where tribal people still live. And although there are elements of warfare and, and uh, conflict, for the most part, all I observed was people uh, cooperating with one another to, uh, to, to survive in the environment. And this social Darwinist view that we've inherited in the West is, I, I think, has had terrible consequences on the on, on the uh, on depression and and other things that people are suffering from today, I think that loss of tribe and that loss of cooperation is a massive problem. And as you say, it really stems from that that belief of uh, this conflict, uh, this Darwinian conflict, apparently that that we all have to uh, destroy one another to be the strongest or whatever else in business or even academia. I would imagine. Um, it's, yeah, it's it's a great example of 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 a cultural belief that has severe consequences. I think. Yes, uh, um, Darwin emphasized very much competition and and struggle, but uh, interestingly, he also maybe not in the first edition of his Origin of Species, but afterwards, he also recognized the importance of cooperation. And mm. unfortunately, many of his followers have not overlooked that so they have become very one-sided in looking mainly at uh, competition but i think in nature we probably as i see it we have both cooperation and uh, competition competition also pl plays a role and i think we we inherited that from our animal ancestors uh, in chimpanzees i mean there is there is competition uh, the males, <laughs> everyone wants to come up with the alpha male, right? So mm -hmm. they compete mm -hmm. with each other. But then there's also much cooperation. So we have both of it. But uh, so what we need, I think, is a balance. And uh, this balance, I think, is, is sorely lacking in our society, uh, especially as I see it in North American society, where there's so much emphasis on competition. And this has also inf infiltrated uh, science. I mean, uh, science has also become very competitive. Uh, so we find it in many aspects of life. and. That is unfortunate because um, this divides again very much and uh, leads to a form of insanity. Mm, absolutely. 
Uh, just back to Plato and Aristotle. Um, one of the more important things that I see as having affected Western civilization in particular is this, I, I believe it's Aristotle, but correct me if I'm wrong, is the split between the body and the mind. And just now you spoke about uh, our ancestors, our animal ancestors, um, and the drives that they have to become the alpha male and, and all those things, I guess, that we consider as animalistic, even though we're imbued with them to a very large degree. Um, in the West, I've noticed that there is, there is definitely a split between the body and the mind, and this has functional consequences. Um, it's, it's gotten to the point where on myself and other people, for example, uh, some body work might be needed to learn how to breathe properly again, or, or we might make young boys sit down all day at school when they just want to run around and, and do stuff. Uh, and I think this comes from this belief that the body is animalistic and bad, and the soul or the intellect or whatever you want to call it is is good is is a definite good and should be emphasized ahead of the animal body um yes so christianity has played a very important role in this sure. I mean, in, sure. in denigrating the body uh, and uh, therefore uh, uh, the Korsipski's uh, ex extensional devices uh, include uh, uh, one device where he suggests is uh, that we should put hyphens between, for example, body and mind to underline that they are not uh, distinct, but they are interrelated, or mm. put a hyphen between organism and environment to stress again the interconnection between the organism and environment. This is also a very important uh, device, I think. And unfortunately, very often, well, due to our categorical thinking, we just divide up things that are interconnected. And uh, this is unfortunate and has really negative uh, consequences. Mm. It's interesting. Uh, again, I was listening to a, a sleep scientist who's become quite prominent. Uh, his name's Matthew Walker. You may, may have heard of him. But uh it's, it's interesting. He's going around the world at the moment emphasizing that uh, the way that we treat sleep, something as uh, important as sleep, is crazy because we tend to operate on the basis that I'll sleep when I'm dead. I don't need to sleep. Uh, it's, you know, I'll, I'll get four hours sleep and I'll just keep soldiering on. And we have this very macho attitude towards something that the body needs to function properly. And it's interesting to see the same I, I believe that extends from the dualism of man uh this dualism between the body and the mind are there are there any other uh how would you say uh outcomes of this that you think are prevalent in society and are, are causing a lot of problems outcomes of what mm. uh, the dualism between body and mind oh yeah yeah sure i <laughs> I think uh, really uh, the body has has been uh, put uh, denigrated so much, and uh, and and I I think it's it's basic, and uh, it has led to so many problems. I mean, I know women, you know, who who have sexual problems because they were brought up with the idea that the body is inferior or maybe even sinful, and uh, and then. Uh, <laughs> there, there are many other ways. Uh, if we are disconnected with the body, I mean that can lead to, to poor health and um, and some form of insanity. Yeah, I think that's another thing we we in the West we really um, we really um, suffered from and continue to suffer. Even even those people who who talk about sexual liberation and so on, in the back of their mind often still have something, an idea, yeah, well, but the body is really not so good or, uh, mm. well, I, I am I, I'm driven to it, but uh, maybe it's, it's not so high and whatever. Uh, mm. I encounter that attitude very often. Mm. Yeah, a lot of the hedonists I know, or self-proclaimed hedonists, uh, very often the most compulsive people that in my life that that I know 
Um, you, you go into empiricism in your book, uh, and in particular, you mentioned sensing, which I found uh, very interesting and relevant. And one of the most powerful meditations I've engaged in, and it's something that I've noticed that no one can really tolerate when they first try to do it, at least to begin with, is simply sitting there and sensing the body and sensing what's going on. Um, certainly when I started to do it, I could not really handle more than one or two minutes of doing this. Like it took quite a while to be able to tolerate what was going on in my body. And I found this curious. Why, why should that be that I can't sit there and do that easily? Um, how does this idea of empiricism and sensing and the body, how does this tie up with science and knowledge? Because you have a really good good bit about it in your book. Yes. Uh, let me say first something about sensing. I think one reason why we have so much uh, difficulty with sensing is because we are brought up in a very intellectual way. We, we talk a lot and uh, we have difficulties being in silence. Uh, to many people, it's even embarrassing when you are with someone together and you don't talk. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so therefore, uh, sensing is, is 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 a way to get over that. And uh, I I find it very very interesting how one can uh, through the senses how one can uh, go to the what I would call the infinite or beyond the senses. For example, for for me the 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 sound sense is very much promoted pronounced I relate very much to sound and music and uh, just uh, uh, listening to a gong to me it transports me far beyond my separate self into into infinity in almost universal uh, uh, experience and um, through sight it's for me it's a bit more difficult but I can also, do it better now. And one thing I learned from Mahamudra and Tibetan Buddhism is um, instead of looking out into the world, let the world look into it. For example, when you are in nature, instead of looking at the trees, let the trees looking into it and behind you. And this creates a connection that is quite amazing. There's also someone called, uh, his name is um, uh, Locke, uh, Locke, I, I forget his, his, his first name now. Mm -hmm. um, he has, he talks about panoramic vision, where you don't just look in front, but where you are all surrounded by, uh, sur surround yourself by, by vision. And that also leads to a much more comprehensive experience. Taste also can be, I mean, if you taste something, it, it can also lead you far beyond everything. So I think the senses are, are so important. The, they, they can open a door to in infinity. And um, therefore, I, I contrasted that with, um, with em empiricism in empiricism. The senses are important, but uh, it's the description of sensory experience. And this, this description, of course, limits it very much because it's, it's in terms of language. So it's abstract already, abstracted from reality. Whereas in direct sensing, uh, we, we, there's this abstraction that occurs in language is, is omitted or overcome. So yes, to me, uh, sensing very important. And I, I think, I think uh, we don't have enough of that in our culture, because our culture is very mind oriented, the thinking mind is so dominant. And then uh, we miss out. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's how I feel about sensing. Now, empiricism. Um, is also limited because, um, well, uh, facts are described again uh, in terms of language, and uh, so um, it's uh, we don't have a direct uh, relation to to the world, but we impose uh, 
the the framework of uh, our language and of categories, uh, ideas, and so on when we describe facts. So, facts. Uh, it's hard to say that right now, <laughs> but uh, but uh, they they remove us to some extent from reality. Uh, uh, but uh, I think they are aspects of reality, as Kosipsky has pointed out. I mean, uh, we don't lose reality completely through abstraction we lose only part of it so uh, this is very much uh, indicated in his differential uh, structural differential because through our um, sensing and and then the language um, description um, we select certain aspects of the unspeakable of the unknowable and uh, the, the big problem is if we think that these aspects that we have selected are the real ultimate reality, and if we don't recognize that uh, these are just aspects of it. So yes, therefore, um, empiricism is somewhat limited. And um, a further limitation is that... Uh, Many people think uh, empiric in empiricism all that counts are facts and factual evidence. But as Foucault, the French uh, historian and philosopher, has pointed out, it's not only evidence, empirical evidence, that plays a role in science, it's also power. Uh, because um, powerful very influential scientists and also scientific communities have an enormous influence, not just through the facts that they provide, but because of the power, the power that they also use then to ignore and suppress other kinds of evidence, something we have seen so well during the pandemic. Mm. Oh, because, yes. uh, because, you know, scientists who had divergent views were ignored and often suppressed, and some of them even lost their position because of that. And uh, so uh, I think the pandemic was a very good example that demonstrated mm. power knowledge and power in the importance of, of power in science. Mm. And so one cannot say that that uh, science is just based on, on evidence. Uh, Ideally, yes, uh, but in practice, I think very often not. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I suppose in Canada, you're, you're very much like Australia. We've been locked down for a long time and, and there's quite draconian measures in place, uh, which I I wonder about the logic behind them, to be honest. Uh, do you have a view on on where this is going to go in, in Canada and Australia? I think we're very similar, actually, the... A lot of the measures that are being taken. Yeah, I don't know where it will go, but uh, uh, there are different possibilities. Uh, uh, we know that um, people who have been vaccinated also may get sick and even die. And we still don't know what will be the long-term consequences of the vaccines. Uh, there are a lot of um, very serious uh, side effects. In fact, in, in the US, they have a uh, uh, an ad virus adverse reporting system mm. um, and um, there they recorded already about 16,000 deaths after vaccination which includes wow. healthy people who, who were healthy before and, and hundreds of thousands of injuries so so far uh, the people who are in power <laughs> they they ignore that and suppress it but i wonder how much longer they can do it especially if if we if there will be more and more injuries so uh, this is um, this is something to be seen i don't know what will happen uh, but at the moment uh, at the moment it's um, scientists uh, like virologists uh, microbiologists uh, uh, medical experts they use their power uh, to uh, suppress uh, alternative views. And uh, here in Canada, I mean, in each province, we have a, 
a medical officer and he more or less decides uh, what should be done <laughs> and uh, ignoring you know all those scientists who have different views i think what we should have ideally is that people who have different views based on evidence they should come together and have a dialogue right and then come to a more inclusive view but this this is really lacking uh, and it's, it's because of the tremendous power of, uh, of the medical elite and also the pharmaceutical industry i think plays a very important role because it also has much power mm -hmm. yeah huge money huge money yes yes i i, I yeah i i often wonder um I wondered what kind of totalitarianism would, would arise within my lifetime because I, I was fairly certain something would happen at some point and I, I never expected it to be health bureaucrats. But uh, there you go. I guess uh, life is full of surprises. Um, yes, in many yes. Ways. I, yeah. I didn't expect that at all because for a long time uh, conventional medicine has suppressed alternative medicine mm. and labeled it often as pseudoscience. But now the new development, interesting new development is that there is a split even within conventional medicine. <laughs> they, are, they are the powerful ones and they suppress other conventional um, medical experts, virologists right. and so on, who disagree with them. So now it has become even more repressive, even within. So that that's something that really surprised me because I, I did not expect that. And I did not expect that it, it would get to such extremes. Sure. And and as we were talking about before, it seems like the, the ways in which we think and, and argue pretty much makes any discourse almost impossible because everything is so emotionally charged. Uh, and and we instantly go into an argument with a, a win or lose either or attitude. It's, I just don't see how it can be resolved through traditional means. It's, uh, it looks grim to me. Yes, it looks grim. I mean, yeah. uh, uh, an awareness of, of general semantics, I think would help a lot, but oh, yeah. unfortunately, Unfortunately, yeah. this is missing. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've, we've spoken a lot about uh, concepts and abstractions and some big ideas. So about how we view science and, and view the world and, and the limitations of our nervous systems. Um, but another big part of general semantics, and, and in your book as well, you go into this a lot, is how language and speaking is involved in abstracting and, and one thing we spoke about was was the verb to be uh and and the is the isness of identity um i i think this is the most practical uh thing korzybski did in many ways and i've i've started looking at e prime or english prime as as a way to try and get out of that mindset C could we get your thoughts on the is of identity and maybe explain it to the audience. What What is this uh, is of identity and why is it important to try and grapple with it and get a hold on it? Well, it's so important because it uh, it overlooks, uh, it, it claims an identity between what's expressed through language and reality, the unspeakable. For example, if we... If we say um, he he is a politician or he is a Christian, well, this may be correct, but that's not all he is. What he really is, <laughs> we don't know. Well, that's far beyond language. Uh, what, when we say he is a Christian, we have abstracted from his whole being only one aspect that may be very important, but that's not all he is. Or when when we say, for example, he is a terrorist, well, of course, uh, that person may do awful things, but again, in his in his being, he's he's more than that. And if we could recognize that, we might speak to terrorists. I read a book called Talking to terrorist where the, I forgot the author but where he shows that talking to terrorists sometimes has really resolved deep 
seeded uh, uh, conflicts and uh, led to negotiations that have been very helpful. But if if you start with the premise that when you say he is a terrorist, when you when you think that's all he is, well then then you miss the point. Then then there can be no connection because y you are not a terrorist. He's a terrorist. So. There's this complete uh, cut there, whereas um, if we or if you say someone is bad, there's this complete cut there. And I mean, if you say someone is bad, uh, uh, I'm not bad. Well, <laughs> who can say that he is, he's not bad at all? I mean, <laughs> or, or someone is only bad. So for that reason, as you know, uh, Kosipsky uh, suggested that we should, if we use the is at all, uh, then we should add etc., mm. which then indicates that we, if we say he's a terrorist and we add etc., that he is much more than just a terrorist. Or if we say he's bad etc., that he is much more than just bad. So for that reason, this is of e enormous importance, I think, because it really would help us to overcome a lot of antagonism, conflict, and even war. Like, uh, you know, uh, former US President Bush, uh, when he referred to the axis of evil, well, that's, that's it, you know. Mm. Again, this may be an aspect of it, but again, if you believe that's it, that's it, then you are trapped in something that can lead to really very catastrophic outcomes, as mm. we've seen it. So, it, it's so interesting. Yes, uh, yeah, sorry, go on. Yes, yes uh, sorry. The the avoiding avoiding the is of identity uh, is um, is is really important. And if we cannot avoid it, to add etc. And if, if we don't want to say too often, etc., at least to be aware of it when we say something, he is that, that that's not what he really is, but uh, that we would have a lot, we will have to add a lot. Sure. Now, I am not convinced uh, that we have to get rid of the verb to be altogether as in E prime, mm. because uh, I, I think uh, there are probably uses of uh, of the verb to be that uh, don't pose such a big problem. But um, I have read a book um, that's written in E prime uh, by Ellis. Uh, it's called uh, How to Deal with a... With a, with a I have forgotten the title. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Care. Take your time. Yeah, uh, I forgot the exact title, but uh, anyhow, he wrote the whole book in in E prime, and I was surprised how he could do that. I mean, to me, this would be very difficult to avoid the 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 verb to be altogether, and and the book was easy reading, so uh, it it can be done. It wow. can be done. I'd like to get that title off you after this, maybe, because I'd like to read that. That'd be uh, interesting. One of the notions I was toying uh, with is how much the, is, the verb to be in the is of identity affects us as individuals in the internal monologue and self-conception we have of ourselves. So we've spoken a lot about, you know, quote unquote, the objective world, but of course, we, we tell ourselves a lot about ourselves and, and run a lot of scripts internally that have the years of identity involved a lot. So a lot of people who are depressed or anxious will say, like, I am a bad person or, you know, they'll make absolute statements about themselves. And I often wonder, could English Prime be a very useful tool for the individual themselves uh, more so than the world at large? in restructuring uh, internal scripts in the way that we think about ourselves. Oh, yes, I think it's very important. It actually, it starts with oneself and then also with others in the world. But uh, I know many people who, who are trapped in some belief and they say, I am whatever, you know, I am uh, inferior. <laughs> mm. I am not good enough and so on. And, and that shapes 
that shapes their perception of themselves. And it's a very mistaken, uh, mistaken perception because, again, uh, they should say, I am that, but I'm depressed etc. I am a lot more. And if they would recognize that they are a lot more than what they say about themselves, this could be very li liberating and very helpful. So yes, yeah. it starts with oneself, I think, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. also about others. Mm -hmm. It's a very good point. Yes. Yeah. I, I've personally, in, in my own work, I found it more useful for myself uh, above all else. But um, that's just me. Um, so um, I guess a good way, uh, something you mentioned before was, was Niels Bohr. And you mentioned uh, his, his idea of subject and object in the book and quantum mechanics and all these sorts of ideas that uh, make it abundantly clear that we don't know the totality of everything. Um, in terms of what is possible and, and the limits of human knowledge. How far do you think we can go as a species? Do you think that it's just the nervous system and, and that's the end of everything? What, what are the limitations to human knowledge and knowing? Uh, is, is the object completely just shaped by our, uh, by our nervous system and, and the subject? What, what can we know? What are the limitations of, of knowing in, in your view? This is a huge question, and I hope I'm expressing myself um, fairly clearly. But for example, we have different interpretations of quantum mechanics. So you have the Copenhagen interpretation and various other interpretations of particle physics. And they have something to say about what we as human beings can know. Do you have any views on, on this? Well, uh, I, I don't know how much more we can learn, but I, I don't see, uh, I, I think there is an enormous potential in science to, to know more and more. And um, so, especially in holistic science, holistic biology, we have uh, recognized uh, interconnections that have not been seen before. In ecology, we have uh, seen interconnections that were undreamt of and uh, that have, have really had enormous uh, consequences for our understanding of the world. So um, I think, that, yeah, there is an enormous potential in science, but, but there are also limitations and uh, these limitations, um, I, one reason why I wrote my book was mm. to point out the limitations of science that are often uh, overlooked. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and I think these limitations can be overcome uh, to, at least, to a considerable extent through philosophy, if we understand philosophy as the uh, as the love of wisdom, not the possession of wisdom, mm, and and especially yeah. through art and spirituality, and in sp spiritual experience, we 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 go beyond uh, thinking, or at least um, <laughs> we try yeah, to go beyond the thinking mind. Or when we have thoughts, we understand that they are not the ultimate reality they come from a deeper reality they emerge from that and they vanish so uh, so we can make a connection uh, through a deeper reality through our senses uh, through sensing and also through meditation and all sorts of meditation so there it becomes uh, there we can reach into the 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 infinite i think um, because uh, there we are no longer limited by categories of space and time and uh, that to me is very important that's been very important in my own life mm. so so this is um, i don't know whether this answers your question yeah i think i think it does uh you, you spoke before about um tibetan meditations i, I believe and I think what you were referring to is is non-dualism, the experience of non-dualism. Uh, and I, I recently actually did did some work uh, on a book by Douglas Harding. I'm not sure if you've heard of him before. He wrote a, a wonderful book called On Having No Head. And uh, what, what this was about was this very simple 
realization, and, and it's very easy to do, that in, in essentially we have no head and that there is no real separation, uh, say my computer screen here to uh, where I'm perceiving it, that, that screen that it's being perceived on, there's no real distance, there's no separation. And this, this experience of the non-dual is highly accessible, I think. It's much more accessible than what, what people think. Um, are, are there any other kinds of meditation that, that you do or you recommend for, for people to, to have a go at? Um, are there things that you've found useful or that you have in your everyday life that you, you practice? Well, in my everyday life, uh, in the morning I get up, the first thing I do is Qigong. And in the evening, the last thing, one of the last things I do is practicing Tai Chi. But I also practice uh, sitting meditation. And uh, I, I try to uh, make my whole life, in a way, a meditation. In other words, to be always aware, you know, that there is, uh, that I'm not trapped in thought, but... Uh, uh, that um, thought just emerges from a deeper reality. Um, uh, Eckhart Tolle, he, he said, uh, referring to the human condition, he said the human condition is being lost in thought. Because, well, we often also identify so much with our thoughts and we think that's reality. But uh, thoughts are just something that... Uh, uh, come out uh, one uh, one uh, I, I have a long I have a meditate um, uh, a CD set by R Reggie Ray about Mahamudra and he said uh, thoughts are just like um, fish you uh, know uh, jumping out of the water mm. <laughs> but uh, there's a deeper reality so uh, so that's what I what I try to uh, to uh, to be in contact with that, but uh, very often, of course, I also get caught in thoughts, and uh, and uh, then I have to bring myself back, uh, and um, and uh, I can I can do that. So I I can I can at any time create this awareness that I am the universe, I am the the whole, I am not just a separate. Uh, a, a separate uh, entity, but um, I, I cannot. I cannot yet uh, keep that always as a background. You know, sure. I, that's I very also I also slip out of it, uh, and so uh, so this is um, something that happens in my book. I I have a a painting by an artist, a friend of mine. At the very beginning, it's called Portal. Mm. And um, and there it, it, you have uh, you have a lot of dots and a sort of network which to me represents science and that all merges into a, a central light into the infinite sort of and I I bought the painting I have it on my wall and when I walk around in my in my room I often look at that and just looking at the center <laughs> I I connect to the infinite so yeah. there are so many ways you know to connecting to that and what may work for one person does not necessarily work for another person um, I have a a wonderful book by Osho. Mm. Um, it's um, it, it's commentaries on an ancient sutra, uh, on a Shiva sutra. It, it's it's about 112, I think, 112 different meditations, and uh, Osho comments about these 112 different meditations, and and he he emphasizes that you don't have to do all of these. You just have to uh, have to find one that really clicks with you and is, is good for you. And uh, I've worked through this whole book and I found a few that, uh, that I mean, to me, uh, just are amazing. They work uh, so quickly. Uh, one, for example, is called, uh, actually, the, the, the title of the book by Osho is called The Book of Secrets. Uh, it's okay. an excellent book I, because I think everyone could find something that that would work for him or her. Mm. But one one for example, one very simple one that that works for me instantly is it says touching your eyes with the palm of your hands like a feather. 
So just like this, and concentrating on the third eye. And this immediately, instantly takes me into the infinite. So uh, for other people, this may do nothing or not work at all. But uh, through this book, and there are quite a number of other meditations in there that work very well for me. So, um, so yes, um, there are many, many different ways. Uh, and uh, also, being in nature can be very meditative. Uh, and um, and many for me for me it has become important that I do dynamic meditations not just sitting and that's why I, I practice uh, why I practice qigong and tai chi because uh, to me the flow is very important and uh, to me that's really a very important aspect of reality that it's like Heraclitus pointed out everything flows right? mm. and and uh, we often get trapped in uh, in uh, fragments, and actually, our language sort of uh, works against the uh, recognition of flow. Because especially when we use nouns, you know, we we separate uh, there is the tree, and then there is uh, a rock, and so on, and uh, we we create uh, separations uh, that, that do not really exist in nature as such. Um, for that reason. I have a short section on that in my book. I've been very interested in a process language that is based only on verbs because verbs mm. represent flow, nouns don't. And uh, I've been very interested in developing a language based on verbs only, but I haven't been able, I haven't been very successful. But I read that some uh, native American Indian tribes in also in Canada, uh, according to Benjamin Worf, had languages that are predominantly based on verbs, or in one case, only based on verbs. And there is one uh, one native speaker who who said uh, at some point uh, he can talk a, a whole day just using verbs. I don't know. I've never met that person. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> but uh, but I think. Uh, I think more uh, infusion of verbs, uh, that could also be very helpful. Uh, um, uh, do you have those languages, do they still exist in Canada or have they gone extinct? Uh, I, I think they still exist. Uh, and at one point I, um, I was thinking of uh, going to one of these tribes and, uh, and finding out more and talking to them. But uh, I realized uh, it might be very difficult to communicate with them. And uh, right. yeah. so I, I gave up the idea. And also it's controversial. As you may know, in linguistics, uh, um, uh, Noam Chomsky has been extremely influential. Mm. And he used his uh, power. He was a very powerful linguistic to really change linguistics altogether and to emphasize that there are these universal um, principles in all languages, whereas Benjamin Worf uh, disagreed with him. And um, and he, Benjamin Worf has, very, has been very much put on the side uh, due to the enormous influence of, of Chomsky. Worf, uh, he emphasized that languages may be really very different, and this difference may influence our perception of the world. So, uh, th therefore, different uh, language, uh, people who use different languages may, may see the world very differently. And, um, and he gave very good examples of that, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Mm. And is that something that Chomsky does not think? I'm not familiar no, with this. No, because uh, Chomsky, he insisted that there is this universal grammar, and therefore we all perceive the world the same way because we use the same grammar. It seems, high, yeah, it seems highly unlikely that uh, someone uh, living on an ice shelf in Canada would see the world the same way as, you know, someone uh, in Silicon Valley programming computers. I, I don't see how that's uh, possible. <laughs> it seems very oh, unlikely. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I traveled a, a lot around the world and uh, went to all sorts of places. And I was always more impressed by impressed by the differences mm. than what, what people have in common. And so I think people really have different perceptions uh, of the world. Um, yeah. and <laughs> so, 
Speaking of academics that have been discounted, something I, I did want to ask you about, and I don't think I've asked this yet, was uh, why is Korzybski no longer recognized? Why? Because I believe he was quite popular in his day, and then he seems to have become a little bit more obscure. Is, is there a reason for that? I'm, I'm not quite clear on the history. What, do you have any theories on why that is? No, I, I don't know, but uh, I... Uh... Uh, one one reason may be because his uh, his uh, science and sanity um, book is really not easily accessible, mm. and um, and also the other reasons may be because as as we already we talked about this already because um, Aristotelian logic has become so deeply ingrained in our soul culture and it's very difficult to go against that mm. and uh, mm. and it's also ingrained in academia i mean i found so often you know that people could see it only one way and then the other one must be wrong and uh, and um, this may also may be also related to a power drive that we want to be in power and uh, and um but uh, <laughs> And and then it's then it's um, people who who devise a school curricula. Uh, they may not be familiar with Kosibsky, so therefore it's not introduced uh, in school. And um, yeah, well, if I would have an influence on the school curricula, that that would be one of the first things I would introduce. And it could be done in a very simple way, and it could make a huge difference. But um, well, I mean, it hasn't happened. What has <laughs> happened is that that there are people who who don't know about Kosibsky still uh, have been able, at least some people, to overcome uh, Aristotelian either or thinking. So, uh, so there, there, there have been other streams in our culture that have uh, pointed out uh, the limitations of the laws of thought, uh, and um, and and that's a good thing. But uh, I just wish, well. Kosibsky would be taught from very early on to mm. university, <laughs> but it isn't. Sure. It, it seems like um, uh, many academics don't take him seriously. And I always wondered why that was. Like uh, like people like Chomsky or whoever else. I mean, do, do they view him as someone important, as an important thinker? I, I've even seen people ascribe uh, the label of you know, pseudoscience to Korzybski, uh several times in articles over the years. Uh, I'm just not sure why that is, because it, it seems entirely reasonable to me, his, his premises, and, and quite uh, quite academic and, and quite well thought out. So I just wonder why he has that, uh, that image in, in the academic consciousness. Well, I don't know how widespread that is, but there, there are people, yes, there are some who consider him pseudoscience, and uh, I, I wonder how much they actually know about him. I think mm. there's a tendency that people who don't like something without studying it just dismiss it as pseudoscience. Uh, this uh, I found so often in alternative medicine. Uh, uh, I've come across doctors, you know, who who tell me uh, this is all pseudoscience, and and they know next to nothing about it. Mm. This is very unfortunate, and of course very unscientific to dismiss something you 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 are not familiar with. So, uh, it, it may be related to also that uh, something that is so different may be threatening to their own uh, restricted view of the world and their restricted logic, and um, yeah, I. I really, I really wonder. I, I also don't know why. And the, the, you know, there is a society for general semantics, and as mm. far as I know, they have only a few hundred members. So yeah, at I, most. I really would mm. like to know. You know, I, I am asking myself the same question <laughs> as you do. It makes so much sense, and yet, uh, it yet. Uh, 
it, it uh, is not recognized. But uh, but then uh, independently of Kosipsky, there have been some developments. For example, fuzzy logic uh, that contradicts the law of the excluded middle. And uh, I've read a very very interesting book by Costco called Fuzzy Thinking, and. Um, this is, uh, of course, also quite compatible uh, or the same thing as what uh, Korsipsky said. So, um, and then uh, what some people call quantum logic or complementarity, that has also been recognized at least in quantum physics, uh, not, not sufficiently in biology and social sciences as far as I can see. But uh, again, um, this is uh, independently of Korsipsky, um, this is um, recognized. So <laughs> I, I wish what could be done about uh, bringing Krasivsky into the mainstream. I, I really don't know. I wish I knew. Hmm. Are you, uh, I guess we should probably look at ending because I've almost hit my allotted time uh, with you. I've actually been speaking for an hour and 25, which is, uh, has gone very quickly. It's been very enjoyable. Um, it's great to, to hear your thoughts on this stuff. Uh, so the question I want to ask is, is maybe a slightly younger person is, uh, are, are you hopeful about the future? Because I am uh, not particularly hopeful about the future and, and, and what I see around me. Uh, without any bias, without too much bias, I try to see things as clearly as I can. But I'm seeing many of these... Uh, the exact things that Korzybski warns against have almost reached a crescendo of of importance uh, to people. And for that reason, in a, in a highly technological society with so many dangers and so many crazy types of research going on, for example, gain of function research or you know thing, things of this nature, I'm, I'm not particularly hopeful about the future. Uh, do you remain hopeful, Rolf? And maybe this is a silly question in many ways, but uh, how, how do you see the future going down? Uh, I am not very hopeful either, but uh, mm. at the moment it certainly looks not encouraging at all. At the moment it looks as if we are going in the wrong direction. But uh, I could still imagine that maybe we go so much in the wrong direction that may cause so many problems that it may come to a tipping point where people in society realizes that we cannot go on like that. Mm. But uh, I, it, it, it's not impossible that this will happen, but uh, I'm not very hopeful that it will. I think we, it seems like we are going more into, a, into techno um, humanism, uh, mm. technological society. Um, and not into post-humanism, you know, where would we would be all together as a united uh, big family. Uh, but uh, I don't know, and uh, mm. I don't want to be um, dogmatic one way or another. But sure. what what I see now, what's going on now, to me is really discouraging. Yeah. But it may change. It may change. Even the the whole outlook about the pandemic may may change too. I mm. don't know. Yeah, I would put a low probability of it changing. But uh, hey, I've I've been surprised before, so hopefully I'm surprised again. Yeah. So uh, just to and, finish and, up. And there oh, sorry, are, go on. Yeah, excuse me. And, and there are certainly even if if mainstream uh, science and society moves in the in the wrong direction, there are still many people. Who, who see that and uh, they are just in the minority and they don't have enough power. So um, if, 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 that, uh, if they could have a greater influence, that may also lead to positive change. So I don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, uh, the people that influence uh, the mass of mankind have become so efficient at almost using uh, these principles that we were talking about before, these uh, laws of thought, that uh, I find it difficult to see how any kind of significant mass awakening could occur because uh, the news media outlets and, and other people, they've almost perhaps unconsciously made an art form out of uh, using these mechanisms of language and thought to, to literally shape 
how people see the world. And uh, yeah, without, without something radical happening, uh, I'm not too hopeful. But uh, anyway, hopefully I'm wrong. So, so Rolf, um, th- thank you so much for coming and speaking with me. Um, just to finish up, do you have any uh, projects on the boil, any channels or or books or anything else that uh, that you'd like to plug, maybe including the book that you've got out now? These days I'm giving uh, interviews on my book. That's my main uh, occupation at the moment, uh, sure. different uh, different places, and, uh, and uh, that's what I'm doing. I don't have any plans uh, writing another book, uh, but uh, I have a very extensive uh, personal website, and I, I keep... Uh, adding on to that and um, also updating and so and and also i mean for my personal development that's uh, important to make progress there <laughs> mm, absolutely <laughs> well, uh, more I, I can recommend that book to everyone it's fantastic i can see, actually see it on your bookshelf behind you there but uh, i i will provide um put um, it there yeah, that's, yeah. because that's... i was I was told for interviews I should put. Yeah, you should. Yeah, it's a it's a good idea, and and I'll I'll make sure that I link to it in show notes and uh, on YouTube and and other places. And I just really recommend to people if if they want to get an idea of what uh, we've been talking about here, what general semantics is all about, and also definitely with with Rolf's own um, input in into that. It's just a it's a wonderful read, and uh, would recommend it to everyone. Well, thank you very much, Alex. It was great talking to you. And uh, I always enjoy very much talking about uh, Kosipski and uh, his importance. Please subscribe for more content and videos like this. We discuss philosophy, practical spirituality and ecology and much more. And your engagement is always appreciated.